Tonight we're going to be opening uh, John chapter 13. I'd like you to open there, please. We're going to be looking at several passages. And the text that we'll be reading, I find very interesting. It's uh, a great lesson on becoming true Christian servants. A title of the message, Becoming a People of the Tower. Let's read chapter 13. Chapter 13, and we'll look at the first five verses, and then we'll skip from five, verse 5 to verse seven, 12 to 17. Chapter 13, we'll read verses, the verses 1 to 5, and then we'll jump over to verse 12 to 17 to get the, the full picture. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, notice now it says, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil, having, no, uh, having now put in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things unto his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, he um, raceth from supper and laid aside his garment and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel wherewith he was girded. If you move over to verse 12, so after he had washed their feet, he had tucked um, his garment and he and was set down, and he said unto them, Know ye uh, what I have done unto you? You call me Master and Lord, and you say, Well, so uh, for so I am. If I then, your Lord, uh, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do it, do so as I have done uh, to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, rather he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, what's the next word? Happy are ye if you do them. I, as I said before, I titled this message Becoming the People of the Tower, but lately I've become the people of the mop. Uh, last week we had a breakage uh, in the plumbing and uh, I had a call from the police, the local police saying, are you the representative of a Royal Baptist Church? And I said, yes I am. He says, you got water flowing out the door into the, the, uh, the pathway. I ran down here, and of course the whole church was um, about half an inch of water, and it took me a while to clean it up. And I wasn't happy. <laughs> and last, uh, that last Thursday, we had another one. Poor Eglie forgot to, um, she came to clean, and she left the bucket in the, in the sink uh, with the tap open, and uh, forgot about it, left. And about three or four hours later, the, uh, I get a call from the administrator saying the same thing. He says, you got another leakage. You need to run because there's water count. The good thing about it, we have kind of a slope going all the way from the sink up uh, to the door. So the water doesn't really come down here. And when I came and started mopping away, this passage came to mind. And I thought, Lord, you have a sense of humor. I've been working on this. And the lesson is not just to do it, but to be happy doing it. How many of you would be happy if you were called uh, by some neighbor and said, hey, you're, there's water coming, coming out of the main door of your house, called by somebody who is, neglect, who is neglecting his, uh, his uh, duties. And uh, <coughs> you would probably come and say, well, obviously I need to kill, I, I clean some uh, floors and I probably need to throw a lot, uh, away a lot of furniture. But I think the last thing you would do is say, praise the Lord for this. And here we have a lesson that teaches us not only to be servants and to do some things that are very awkward, like washing feet, 
And he said, I'm, I'm showing you an example. And I want you to learn a lesson from this example. So let's look at this together this afternoon and see what we can learn. Let's go to the Lord in prayer first. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we come to a passage like this and in the 21st century it seems very awkward, Lord, to read it. Seems awkward that the Lord of Heaven, the King of Kings, the Mighty One, the Almighty One, will take on flesh to dwell among, among His creation only to serve as a servant and then teaching this wonderful lessons to his disciples. We would never even consider doing anything like this in church today. But there is a lesson here that I think we all need to learn if we truly want to be servants of Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord, that you will help me be able to deliver this in the spirit of the, in which the text was written. And that, Lord, help each one of us glean the lessons that we need because, Lord, although we might not be washing feet today as travelers come to our, to our home, uh, but we do have a responsibility to serve you with this kind of spirit. So, Lord, I pray that you will help me be able to deliver this message. Give me um, utterance, give me the, uh, the words in English that I need sometimes. My mind just goes off in Spanish and I find it hard to... Uh, translate all that, Lord, into English. But I pray your spirit will make the difference. May we understand the message that you have for us this afternoon. And more than understand it, may we apply it in every situation that we might come across. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, one of the most intriguing characters that I find in the Bible, we've been studying the book of Colossians, and I finished uh, chapter 4 by going one by one through all those names we find in the book of Colossians that Paul mentions. He mentions a man called Epaphras. But we, there's another individual with the name Epaphroditus. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I'm not sure if he's the same man as Epaphras, but surely this man Epaphroditus had the same kind of spirit, the same servant spirit that, uh, that uh, Epaphras had. Um, we find Epaphras' uh, testimony in Philippians chapter 2, if you turn your Bibles there to verse 25 through 30, I want you to see something because I'm going to make a comment on this man that I think we can learn from. Uh, Philippians chapter 2 verse 25 through 30 says, But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger. Whom you sent, notice why he went to Paul, who you sent to take care of my needs, to serve me. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died, but God had mercy on, uh, on him, and not only on him, and not on him only, but also on me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be uh, glad and I may be less uh, anxiety. So then, welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor people like him, because he almost died, pay attention to this, he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. Wow. <coughs> now, people like, Christians like Epaphroditus are rare individuals. Epaphroditus had a true servant spirit like the Lord Jesus Christ. And the text tells us that Epaphroditus served the Apostle Paul, there in verse 25. Notice what it says, whom you sent to take care of my needs. But then, in this, uh, while doing this task, he became very sick. And even, he was even worried, not about his own sickness, but about other believers not knowing that he was sick. Because it, it might disturb them. Paul tells us that the sickness Epaphroditus suffered came about because 
He was a servant. Verse 30, Paul says, because for the work of Christ that he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life, to supply your lack of service towards me. Not regarding his life is interesting. It is a gambling term, and it means to recklessly expose one's life to danger, not caring about itself. In gambling technology, it means to risk everything on one roll of the dice. Epaphroditus willingly placed this life on the line to serve Paul. He gambled, which was the idea here, he gambled everything for Jesus Christ so that this man, Paul, would be served and the Philippian church, which had sent him to Paul in the first place, would be well represented. Now, I was doing some research on this word gambling, referring to Ephroditus, and I came across a very interesting article that I'd like to read to you. It says this, this is around 250 AD, a group of early Christians around, around ancient Carthage, am I pronouncing that? A carta in Spanish, I'm not sure how to pronounce it in English, <laughs> called themselves the Gamblers, 250 AD. They named themselves after Epaphroditus. The story goes on saying the deadly plague blocked, uh, broke out in Carthage, and these people went into the city of Carthage during the height of the plagues when bodies were stacked head high along the streets and carried the dead outside the city and buried them. They risked their very lives to serve the citizens of Carthage, and many of whom hated them because they were Christians. They exposed themselves, they, these people possessed the same spirit that Epaphroditus uh, possessed. So where did Christians like Epaphroditus and the Gamblers get their desire to serve others? Uh, after all, this is not a natural desire. Uh, how about we try to give it a try this afternoon? I've got a couple of buckets out there. <laughs> and I'm going to start with John. John, uh, you have to do it with the same spirit you can. You have to do it all the way to the end. You start washing feet this afternoon. All right? You got the bucket. We got the buckets. Oh, you got the soap. <laughs> Some have not washed their feet in two weeks, so they're not prepared. <laughs> you know, this is not something that we would, we would go for. I would even feel uncomfortable anybody touching my feet. But there's a lesson here that I think we can learn from, and it's a lesson that transcends time. It's not just something that uh, Jesus wanted to teach his disciples then, 2,000 years ago, but notice he says, you need, this is an example that I'm giving you. This is something that needs to move on if you really want to be my disciples. This is the Christian spirit. To have a slave spirit, someone who would give themselves over, not just to the Lord, but to be able to give themselves to others with this kind of sacrifice. <coughs> now, in the passage before us, in John chapter 13, we see the selfless Savior in action. He's saying, well, look at me, this is how I want you to be. And that night before his death, Jesus assumes the place of a slave, and he serves his disciples this way. And while they were eating the Passover, Jesus gets up, uh, and... Uh, he gets up on the table and starts, just goes up, up, over there and gets a towel. He pours a basin of water and he began to wash the disciples' feet. And when Jesus did this, he took the place of a slave. Now think of this, we're not talking about anyone. We're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Taking the place of a slave before his men. And he took the place of the lowest kind of slaves who were called the people of the towel. They were called this because it was the job of the it was their job to wash their feet uh, of those who were superior to them. And Jesus did, did this to call his disciples to become people with this kind of spirit. And listen, this is where it gets a little uh, kind of uh, hard to grasp because the Lord said, "This is I want you to do the same thing." So when you're here this afternoon, you came. To be served, or did you come to serve? What kind of spirit did you come with? 
Did you come with this kind of attitude where if I like it, I'll stay? If I like the people, I'll continue coming. But if I don't like it, I'm gone. What kind of spirit do we have? In order to achieve this goal in our lives, we must develop a heart like our Savior's. And we can, we can become, whether it's the people of the Tao, the people of the mob, or whatever, we need to have this attitude of service one to another. So I think there's several lessons that I'd like to bring out from this text. And uh, let me show you where we're going with this. First of all, we must learn from his labor, that is, the Lord Jesus Christ. He gives us the example. He says, learn from me. I'm giving you an example. We must learn from Him, from Jesus Christ, verses 4 through 5. And the second thing in verses 12 through 17, we see that we must learn from His Lordship. And then in verse, in, in the verse 1, we go back to verse 1, we must learn from His love. The first point here, verses 4 and 5, is we must learn from His labor. Let's read again verses 4 and 5 to have it fresh in our mind. It says, after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples', uh, disciples feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. Notice who he goes to first. Simon Peter. And, of course, what kind of response does Simon Peter have when something's going on? Who said to him, Lord! Are you going to wash my feet? He's very surprised. So you see here Jesus prepared to have supper and then after that he wrapped a towel in his body and not only washed the feet of his disciples but then went thoroughly to all of them, not just one, wasn't just Peter and I'm finished. No, he goes to number one, then goes to number two, wipes, washes his feet and dries his feet. Number three, number four, number five, number six, number seven. By number seven, I would give up. <laughs> no, he goes to number eight, number nine, number, even to Judas Iscariot, who was going to betray him. <coughs> he does this. I don't know about you, but when I see this, I, stay, I sit back and I think, Lord, it just... You know, to my 21st century mind, with the attitude that this culture brings across, this does not make any sense. But I want it to make sense. Because you know when I came the other day to mop the floors, I said, look how humble I am. <laughs> I'm the humblest person in this church. <laughs> if anybody saw me right now, they said, look, the pastor is so humble, he's walking off the floors. <laughs> You can do this out of pride too, you know. <laughs> but the thing about it is, I wasn't happy. There wasn't any joy in my heart. I missed the point. And as I was mopping, I said, okay, now you're doing, you're, you're having a foot washing experience, Sam. <laughs> but how does the Lord see you at this moment? What kind of heart are you going with? And you know, my heart stunk at that moment. I can only feel shame because of the attitude I was doing this with. In fact, when I called the lady, that lady, cleaning lady, who was who was responsible of all this, uh, I was I was on the edge. I said, "So and so, did you uh, come and clean this way out? I was there this morning and I was cleaning. I cleaned everything very, very nicely." I said, "Yeah, so nicely. And now we have water everywhere." What do you mean? I, yeah, this water. The, 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 um, uh, we we have it. Uh, the, the the local next door has a similar problem, um, and uh, so I was, I was I had an attitude. That's what I'm trying to say. And I I hung up and said, "Well, to be right now, I have to keep on cleaning." And the poor, I must say, Eglis, you know, Eglis, he said, "I'm so I don't know what to say, Pastor." So I was mopping away, and I thought, Sammy, you did a really good job there. <clears throat> if this was to be done to the Lord Jesus Christ and you did it with that attitude, how do you think you would see it? This is an opportunity to serve. And instead of doing it with the selfless attitude, I was arrogant about it. I'm confessing my sins, as you can see. But how many times do we fall into this trap? I'm going to do something for the church, only to kind of 
blow up like, like a, a blowfish and a balloon fish and uh, say, look how, how faithful I am, you know. Wash your feet was slaves work. Even Jewish servants could not be forced to wash their master's feet. It was the, the task we served for the lowest of the Gentile slaves. Sometimes a child would, be, would wash their parents' feet. Sometimes a wife would uh, wash his husband's feet after long days of work. Or a friend would wash a friend's feet in a display of extreme affection. But Jesus took the place of a slave before his disciples and washed the feet of all of them. He willingly humbled himself to meet a need in the lives of his men. He washed the feet of his disciples without being asked to do. And of course, he produced a shock. And the Apostle Peter, Lord, what are you doing? You're washing my feet? And of course, I showed him a lesson. If I, you don't want me to wash your feet, I can't do anything with you. Didn't go that way. But notice verse 6 and 8 through 8. Uh, he came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, do you not realize now what I'm doing? Don't you understand what's going on here? And later you will understand, he says. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. So it was a breach of his hospitality to wash the feet of a guest. We see that very clearly in Luke chapter 7. Verse 40 through 50, let me just read this section to you because <laughs> Jesus is also teaching a lesson to the Pharisees. He says that Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher. As he said, two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he forgave the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Some replied, I suppose the one who had the biggest debt be forgiven. You have judged correctly, said Jesus. Then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came out to you this house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my beard. Now, I wouldn't like that to happen. <laughs> uh, but she poured perfume on my feet. Notice the lesson. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love she, uh, has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little uh, loves little. Then Jesus said unto her, Your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who's this guy that's forgiven sins? Who's this one who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now, the disciples should have been falling one over the other towards the Lord's feet if they really understood who he was. But it never occurred to them. In fact, you see uh, the Apostle Peter protesting, what are you doing? You can't, be, you can't be doing this. And I'm sure the other disciples who were listening to him said, yeah, you tell them, this is just wrong. This is just, this, 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 this is not the way to go. You're supposed to be the master. You're supposed to be the one in charge. You're supposed to be the one honored. And now you're doing this to us? And he said, well, you see, this is how it works in my kingdom with me. If you want to have a relationship with me, if you really want to be called servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, this is how it works. Jesus served with no expectation of reward. He didn't expect a thank you. Sometimes when we get to do things, we think, boy, the church is going to be really happy when they see what I did last week, you know. And when nobody says anything, you feel like discouraged. You feel like, you know, turned down. Nobody even said thanks, you know, and, and uh, you're going to have this attitude. You know, we need to watch out for those things because sometimes we, just by having that attitude, shows that we're really not doing it for the Lord. <clears throat> so we see Simon here giving us uh, the wrong example, telling Jesus what to do, and Jesus telling him what to do. 
Jesus served those who did not deserve to be saved. So, so I want you to think for, for a moment with me. He washed the feet of Simon Peter, but before the night would end, those feet would stand by a Roman fire as Peter would deny his Lord. He even washed the feet of Judas Iscariot. His feet had already carried him to the Jewish leaders who he bargained away the life of Jesus for a few pieces of silver. And before this night would end, those same feet would carry him back to the Jews where he would completely abandon Jesus to his enemies. And then what about the other ten? Jesus washed the feet of the other ten also. And before the night would end, all those feet would be running away in fear. Jesus knew about this. He knew about this. He knew this was going to happen. And still, that night, he goes and washes his disciples' feet. Now, if I knew something, if I knew you're going to betray me, I would not wash your feet. <laughs> In fact, you you can you can plead all day long, give me all kinds of gifts. I'm still not washing your feet. Only kidding. But you know, the Lord knew about this. He knew beforehand that this was going to happen. He told them, you will dis you you'll betray me. Remember when Peter said, Lord, I'm gonna, I'll be right with you, right, right by your side, all the way to the end, even if he means that I'm going to be with you. Of course, that was typical of a Peter, full of Peter. On the day of Pentecost, you see a different Peter. So you see Jesus in, in John 13, 5, you know, washing their feet and wiping their feet. And the idea here uh, is both these verbs are in the tense that speaks of continual ongoing activity. It goes like this. After that, he poured water into the basin and began to what? Began, but he didn't give up until the end. He, 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 he did a wonderful job. Those disciples never had the cleaner feet after that night. In other words, Jesus kept at the task until it was complete. He worked until every dirty foot was cleansed. Jesus did not did what he did for a very specific purpose. He wanted to teach them something about true servanthood. He wanted to teach them about something about being a true Christian. If you want to follow me, this is how you're going to have to be. Now this is a hard lesson for all of us. Because maybe tomorrow you'll face, you'll have to go through a foot washing experience. I remember years ago, it wasn't clean water coming down the pipe, it was the drain that broke, the drain this thing that broke there in the, in the elbow and uh, all kinds of stuff from the, the toilets of the neighbors started coming down. When I learned about it, we had a, a nice uh, extended display of poop all over the church. I didn't want to clean that. But nobody was around. That was another really difficult foot washing experience that I had to go through. You know, and it, I, I did very well then because I wasn't like, where's everybody? You know, I'm, I'm the pastor. No, it was like, well, Lord, I was asking you to, today uh, to serve you, and uh, this this is uh, the way you want me to serve you, and you want me to serve you with a with a joyful heart. So you know what I was doing? I was cleaning poop with a joyful heart. <laughs> <laughs> That's not easy to do. And I'm not saying this to brag, but you know that day I did very well. I went home and I said, "Boy, you know I'm a very good poop cleaner." <laughs> uh, and uh, when I went home, my wife saw me with a smile. She says. Oh, something good happened today. I said, yeah, let me tell you about it. <laughs> we will come across situations like this. There will be moments, moments when you least suspect it, when God's going to test you and say, let me see what kind of spirit, let me see how much you have really grown in, 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 in Christ. Let me, let, let me see, uh, not, not that he needs to see it, but so that he can show you the kind of attitude we normally have when something unpleasant has to be done and you're expecting somebody else to do it for you. It might be when you go back home. Something breaks. Honey, can you pray? Can you uh, uh, fix the plumbing? Maybe tomorrow. 
Oh, gang, this is dope. Oh, look what you've done now. You know, you, sometimes you, you come across situations like that with this kind of spirit. And the wife appreciates it when you do it, when you do it that way, when you respond that way, right? We should be remembering these lessons that we're looking at today. We must be willing to humble ourselves and do whatever is necessary. I'll read it again. We must be willing to humble ourselves and do whatever is necessary to serve others. And that happens many if you mean it. If you don't mean it, don't give me an amen. But if you mean to say, Pastor, I'm going to give you an amen to that. Amen. Boy, that was a really low amen. <laughs> okay, I'll do this. Next time the, the, the we, we have a plumbing problem, I'm going to call you. <laughs> I'm busy. I'm preparing the sermon for Sunday. I'm the pastor. And I need a good sermon. You have a sermon spirit. Pastor, you can count me. Well, the key is in the Hercules reception area, and you can open the church, and you have a mop, you have a bucket, you have all kinds of things to clean a ton of poop. How many of you would say, praise the Lord, I was looking for an opportunity to serve the church, and here it is. All right, thank you very much. You need an Irish woman to be raising their hands or something like that, amen? You know, you, you think this is a joke, but it isn't a joke. This is real stuff. This is what Jesus, this is the nitty gritty of Christianity. Having this willingness, this selflessness to say, Lord, count on me whatever the situation is. Not just for the big stuff, not just for the preaching, not just for the teaching, but whatever dirty job comes along. I'm here, Lord. You say, well, I wouldn't do that. The Lord did. Not only claimed, he came and cleaned their feet, he took your sins and put them upon himself. Those dirty, stinking sins that you committed, God said, I'll clean those too. Boy, this is <clears throat> humbling. In Philippians 2, 4, 5 says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also the things of others. Let this mind be in you. You want to be a Christian? You want to think like Christ? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And what does it continue saying? Being in the form of God, he took it. Well, he, 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 they, it was not robbery. I'm, I'm thinking in Spanish now. Uh, it, it, it didn't consider it robbery to take himself from the throne and take the, a human form, not to be a king upon his creation, but to be a servant upon his creation. Chapter 2 tells us of the, uh, how Jesus Christ humbled himself and put himself in a situation that he did not deserve, only so that you will be able to receive that wonderful gift of salvation. In Romans 12, 10 it says, Be kind and affectionate one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. So we must learn to serve without having to be asked. Amen? Amen. We must learn to serve, serve others willingly with no thought of reward. What are we going to get out of this? No. We must learn to serve those who are selfish. Now that's hard. Who refuse to serve. That's okay. You don't want to. I'll do it. I'll do it. No problem. I'm still happy inside. And we must learn... We must teach the next generation this kind of Christian spirit to serve others. Teach them by encouraging them to be more involved in service and teach them by example. Jesus Christ said, I'll give you an example. This is how it's done. Let me do it. If you think you're bigger than me, remember who Jesus Christ is. Lord, we can't do this. You can't do this. And God said, well, then you can't be with me. You cannot be my, uh, my follower. So we must learn from this labor. And the second thing we must learn from is lordship. And I, I want you to turn now to chapter 13, verse 12 through 17. And so after he had washed their feet and had talked his, uh, taken his garment and was set down again, he, had, he said unto them, know ye what I have done to you? Do you understand what I'm doing? You call me Master and Lord. And you say, well, because I am. I, I am. <laughs> if then, if this is true, if you, have, if you consider him to be Lord and Master, 
have washed your feet, ye, let's all read together this passage. The last sentence in verse 14, ye also are to wash another's feet. Okay, did you get that? How many got that? Roy only got that. Okay, let's read it again. Ye also ought to wash another's feet. Did you get it this time? Let me see your hand if you got it this time. I think we need to read it again. Some have not got it yet. Ye also ought you also ought to wash another's feet. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna repeat this until everybody in this room raises their hand. You got it? You want to save time? Everybody raise their hand. You also ought to wash under this feet. So next Sunday, guess what we're going to have? <laughs> barbecue. No, no, not barbecue. Everybody joins for that. Now this is something that we should be eager to do. In verse 4, Jesus rose from supper. He had already risen from his throne. He left his throne and from his fellowship with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit in heaven to come to earth. Jesus had already covered his glorious state in human flesh as we see in chapter 2 verse 5 through 8. But now in John chapter 13 for Jesus girded himself with the towel. And he said so he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped the towel around his waist. Let me tell you something that happened to me not too long ago. We had a lady, she'll be coming very soon from Nigeria, uh, Sharon. And she came to my place, she was staying in the, uh, my neighbor's place. And here I was mopping. And I was, I do that pretty good. I've learned that uh, in this church very well. Uh, I was uh, just cleaning around. And she said, Pastor, what are you doing? I said, I'm cleaning. She said, no, don't do that. I said, in Nigeria, pastors never would do that. I said, shame on them. <laughs> she felt so bad about it. I said, Sharon, this is nothing new. If the pastors over there in Nigeria are being put on a pedestal, they're not doing the pastor any favor. If they truly have a pastor, uh, you know, the, the, the Christian spirit, they should be willing to serve their people. Not the other way around. Sometimes we put pastors up there on a pedestal. Pastor, you just preach and teach and we'll do all the dirty work. Let, give, me, give me some dirty work to do, okay? Maybe not mopping, you know, <laughs> but it's okay. Whatever it comes. It doesn't really matter. It's about serving the Lord with all your heart, with all your might, and doing it with a cheerful spirit. When it comes to uh, washing dirty feet, let's do a good job. Let's do a thorough job. Let's not do it halfway. Now, I'm just trying to remind you who this was that took water and a towel to wash the feet of his disciples. Who was he? This man was and is God in human flesh. This was and is the Lord of glory. This is the creator of all things, according to Colossians 1.16. This is God in human flesh, John 1, Philippians 2, Colossians 1, John 14. This is the Savior, the Redeemer, and the Deliverer of lost sinners, 1 Peter chapter 1. This is the King of kings and Lord of lords that's taking the towel and thoroughly washing the disciples' feet. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, this is the example I'm giving you. Now you go and do the same thing. Again, this is weird in the 21st century to think this way. And this is not an option, by the way. He says, this is a command. If then your Lord and Master have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. You ought to. The word ought is in a tense that suggests we should always be washing feet. Oh no, that's not a good thing. No, that we should always be willing to serve. Time is running fast and I need to move on. We are never more like Jesus than when we are serving others. Amen. Amen. In Luke 6, 14, he says that the supper is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be his master. 
When we humble ourselves and assume the position of a slave before others, we demonstrate the true, the true Christ likeness. Serving others is a recipe, listen now, for happiness. In John 13, 17, notice where it says, if you know these things, listen, happy are ye if you do them. So you know what this means? You need to keep on mopping floors, cleaning, cooking, everything what else, until you're happy doing it. I mean it. It takes, it takes experience, it takes practice. It's like when, you know, wife calls you to do something and you do it with a bad attitude. She said, no, that's okay, don't do it, I'll do it. You're going to do it with that attitude, but it better not. There's a time when we volunteer to do some things, we do it kind of with that kind of that spirit. And the Lord says, no, don't worry about it. It's really a privilege that I'm giving you. So we must learn from his labor. And we must also learn from his lordship. And notice now, chapter 13, word verse 1, we must learn from his love. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hours was come, that he should depart out of this, uh, this world out to the Father, note it now, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. I'm um, preparing a series of messages. I don't know when I'll preach them, but I'm working on it now, getting doing the investigation. It has to do with men in the Old and New Testament who ended well. You know, I came across an article that said, and this was apparently well studied, that less than 30% of the characters that we see in the Old and New Testament ended well. And the article went on to mention some very big names that have existed in the last 50 years. And the article said, you know, even in our time, less than 30% of the men who used to be in ministry have ended well. Talking about ending well, the Lord loved them all until the end. When it comes to serving the Lord, it's not just about doing things, it's doing it with love. If you don't do it with love, remember what 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says, it's like a, a can that just, like a trumpet that just sounds and it just makes noise. So one final lesson presents itself, itself in this passage. This, uh, this thought tells us why Jesus did everything he did. It tells us why he came into this world in the first place. It tells us why he became a man. It tells us why he laid aside the riches of heaven to embrace poverty on earth. It tells us why he died for us on the cross. And it tells us why he willingly assumed the place of a slave to serve his servant, his men. He did it because he loved them. I don't know about you, ladies, but maybe you've had to, you know, you saw you're so busy doing all kinds of things. You know, women's jobs are never finished. I take my hat off to ladies today, mm -hmm. especially Christian ladies who know how to serve the family. They might have an eight hour job, very hard job, and they would come home, they, they rest the rest of the day, right? Right. No, they keep on cleaning, they keep on washing, they keep on you know, uh, putting things in order. And they make you feel bad because you just laid your shirt on top of the bed. <laughs> Which, is that supposed to be there? It doesn't really matter. Yeah, but it's just supposed to be there. It's just supposed to go on the closet. Yeah, but I find it easier there. Women have a strange way of confusing men. They put shirts on a hanger. <laughs> And you know what a, a wife wants to hear from her husband? Yes, honey. I'll do it right now. I've been telling my wife that for the last six months and she doesn't believe me. <laughs> I'm going to get to it. You know, Jesus did this all the way to the end. So we think about individuals like Aphrodites, the kind of heart that he had. He was... He came down sick because of his service to the Apostle Paul. And he became concerned because he didn't want to worry the other Christians because, you know, thinking that, now they know I'm sick. No, don't tell them. It's okay. This kind of spirit is very, very rare. 
So when I think of Epaphroditus, I kind of relate him to Epaphras in Colossians chapter 1 and chapter 4. Boy, you know, the heart of this man, Epaphroditus, is hard to find. Colossians 1 Corinthians 13, 5, we see what genuine life, a genuine love does when it serves. It says, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own. So my question again tonight, like in the same way I started, are we people of the town? Are we, do we have a true servant spirit? If you say, well, maybe not, but I do want to, because I want to be more like my Lord Jesus Christ. Well, then we need to learn from his example. We must learn from his labor. He gives us an example. He doesn't just tell us what to do. He says, this is how it's done. Let me show you. Being Lord, we learn, we must learn from his Lordship. He's still Lord. Even while he's washing his disciples' feet, he's no less Lord than when he came down from heaven. And we must learn from his love. You heard that person, I got an interesting story about the most humble person in the world. In the article went like this. You probably heard of the man who thought he was so humble, he would go around making sure everyone knew that he was very humble. Since nobody paid any attention to him, he thought he would just bring it up to himself to start going around bragging about how humble he was. So he went around. He said, did you ever pay attention? Did you know? You probably have it, but I am probably the most humble person in this room. You didn't notice. So he went like this only to get a very awkward look. You know, when, if you truly want to be a humble person, the first thing you need to understand that is that you're not important. That um, the thing you would have in your mind is, the less thing you have in your mind is me. The, mo the, mo the thing that we should have in our mind is you. Others. This was the spirit of Christ. And this must be our spirit. A true servant looks at the, at the needs around him and just does what needs to be done without being asked, without uh, uh, expectation of reward, without expectation of thanks, with nothing more at heart than a desire to love and act like Jesus Christ. You know, this preparing this message was so hard for me because I realized the Lord needs to do a lot of work in me yet. How many of you feel the same way? You need to go back to the book and understand what true Christianity is all about. We tend to criticize Catholicism. We tend to criticize different denominations because of what they believe. But maybe we should do a little, a little bit more introspection. We need to look in the mirror and say, what about you, buddy? What, if Christ was here to, to right now, what would he be pointing at in your life? Let's become the people of the town. Let's go to the Lord and find that humility that he had. And that desire that Epaphras had to serve others with the same spirit. Let's die to self, because that's where it all begins. Let's all stand and have a word of prayer. Father, when I see the example of Epaphras, Epaphroditus, when I see the example of the Lord Jesus Christ, and see their selfless, attitude, Lord, just and then I compare it to my own heart. I see that there's lots of work to be done. And I pray that you will continue molding me. And that, Lord, you will continue molding each one of us in this room. We call ourselves Christians. But when we come to the true Christian spirit, the servant um, the servant's attitude of Jesus Christ we realize we still have a lot to learn 
I pray, Lord, that you will continue working in us. Break us, Lord, in the areas that need to be breaking. Prune those areas, Lord, of pride and arrogance that sometimes of grows in us. I pray, Lord, that you will continue working in us so that to the point that when we find something to be done, we, without being asked, we jump into it and do it with a joyful spirit. Develop in us, Lord, this, this, um, this characteristics, the characteristic, characteristic of humility. <clears throat> May you continue doing it, Lord, until we are like Christ. May this world see that this is not something weird, that this should be everybody's attitude. If the world would only react this way, it would be a very different place. I pray that you continue working each one of us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.